Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rob Barrett, I'm from Queen's University Belfast and currently doing a PhD there. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, Unity 3D scripting um, and also about Neolithic Malta. So I'll start off with a bit of a theory and then we'll go into more practical examples in a minute. Um, so I use 3D reconstructions um, that are using SketchUp mainly and other software as well. Um, and when you think of 3D reconstruction in archaeology, you're generally looking at stuff like this. You know, in publications especially, you've got still images that look very pretty, but are not actually adding a lot to the discourse. Um, and I think this is a shame because 3D reconstruction can be used for interpreting archaeological sites and producing new data. So what I, when I think about 3D reconstruction and the kind of stuff I work with, it's more this kind of thing, um, where you've got Amazon. Uh, these which are not as pretty, not as nice, but what I'm trying to do here is produce new data that can aid uh, the archaeological interpretation. And using custom scripts and gaming software um, is very useful to create this kind of information. Um, oh, whoa, that's went really quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but before we get into the examples, um, Obviously, 3D reconstruction um, is it's kind of a fringe um, subject in archaeology. It's not integrated as of yet with uh, normal archaeological practice or traditional archaeological practices. And this is because uh, it's, it's mistrusted. Like, people think that it is an inaccurate tool. Um, and the reason for this is that when you've got something like this, uh, a nice 3D model like this, um, it's very difficult to know if... You know, is this roof still there? Is it collapsed? Is this in the hypothesis or is this uh, what's actually seen in the archaeological evidence? And this has led a lot of, of uh, traditional archaeologists to believe that pre construction can't be trusted, it can't be used for interpretation because the, there's a mixture of, of real and fake, essentially, in these models. And this is something which is called hyperreality. It's a term which comes from Baudrillard. And it's essentially the idea that there's some, some things which have elements of fiction and truth that are so mixed together, it's difficult to distinguish the two. So think of, for example, a reality TV show. Uh, you've got genuine emotions, you know, general, genu genuine reactions, but you've also got scripted elements, you've got edited elements. So it's very difficult to determine when you just watch the TV show to determine what is real and what is fake there. And this is what happens in 3D reconstruction, because you've got that final model and you've got elements which are based on archaeological evidence, elements which are the ideas of the modeler, and it's often difficult to, to distinguish the two. But my main argument is that this is how archaeology works. In archaeology, you don't have an objective view. Um, this little thing I've come up with is just, oh, it's just a way of showing um, this argument. Um, archaeology is interested in an archaeological past. This is the historical past, you know, the Roman times, prehistory, and this is objective. This is, you know, it was one way and it wasn't another. But the problem is, this archaeological past is lost to us. Uh, we have no way of accessing it, if not through the archaeological remains. Um, so our view of this archaeological past is already quite limited, and we have to go through a medium in order to access this information. But well, we don't get this information directly from the archaeological remains. This goes for an entire long process. The archaeological past is, is uh, represented by our archaeological remains. The archaeological remains are replicated by our archaeological records. And our archaeological records just provide constraints for our archaeological interpretation. So by the time we get to archaeological interpretation, we have a hyperreality. We have something where the real and the hypothetical is all intermixed, and it's very difficult to determine which is which. So this, this is not... Uh, archaeological interpretation is not an objective truth. It is very much uh, a subjective uh, reality. And in archaeology, uh, in 3D construction, we have a very similar uh, kind of um, system. We've got the archaeological past, we've got the archaeological remains. The archaeological remains have been replicated with our archaeological records and our base model. Um, and then that provides constraints for the hypothetical model, the, the hyperreality. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that archaeological, traditional archaeological methods are not that different um, to what we're doing in 3D reconstruction. Um, and in a way, if you've got uh, problems with how hypothetical reconstruction of 3D models 
uh, handled. This is a wider problem for archaeology. It's not specifically for the reconstruction. Um, obviously, this is not satisfactory, saying that something is subjective doesn't necessarily make it right. So we have to look at metadata and power data, and this is our way to guarantee um, or at least help uh, this process. So if you got, you know, if you if you record all the steps that take you from the hypothetical model all the way back, you can trace that back, and you know, and future uh, researchers can trace it back and uh, work out what is real and what is fake in in the hypothetical model. So it's like, it's kind of guaranteeing a way of verifying and replicating the results. Um, so the whole reason of me uh, introducing this is to show that um, using simulations, 3D reconstruction, um, any kind of, of computer-aided um, research is, is valid because it's, it's part of the archaeological discourse. It's part of what we already do. Um, and I mean, that's kind of what I'm doing for my PhD. So, so hopefully at the end of it, I will be able to show exactly um, but moving on to like, more practical things of what we'll be talking about today, um, custom scripts, um, this is basically just computer scripts that are written to answer a specific archaeological um, question. Um, so game engines are fantastic because they, they give you the, the possibility to create uh, a simulation. You've got your 3D model, you can modify different elements, you can change around different things and you can test different theories. And by using custom scripts, you can ask a very specific question and get a very specific answer. And that's what I'm aiming um, to do today. Oh, that went to the head again. Um, <laughs> all of this, uh, it's all spoilers, but, you know. Um, so for today, I'm going to be looking at a few examples from Neolithic Malta. Uh, now, Malta, uh, some of you may know a bit about it, some may not, but Malta is a series of islands in the Mediterranean. Um, they are fairly small, um, but they are characterised by a very important historical past. Uh, in the Neolithic, there was uh, a, a, a group of people who created enormous megalithic structures, um, and this, we, these were from around 3600 to 700 BC, although realistically, Neolithic is to 2400. Um, and these big structures usually take two forms. They can either be above ground temples, um, which are just made of enormous <coughs> stones. Think about Stonehenge, but more, more complex. Um, or they can be underground, so they can be hypogea, and the hypogea were generally used for the burial of the dead. Um, and the Maltese uh, rituals and beliefs seem to uh, concentrate on, on binaries, especially the binary of light and dark which um, are representative of uh, life and death as well. And some of these will come up uh, when I'm in the examples. So two sites I've, I was looking at uh, for this kind of research are Gigantia, which are, is, a, is a temple complex. It's characterized by two different temples side by side, one and two. Um, and that's the 3D model next to it. So this is a temple. It, it, uh, it's not got any burials in it. It was theoretically used as a, as a sacred place, but that's debatable. Um, the other site I'll be looking at today is the Vroktov Circle, which is a hypogea, so this is underground. Uh, I mean, this is what it looks like today. Um, the, the roof has collapsed and therefore it's not underground anymore, but in the past it would have been all covered up. And inside of this, uh, many hundreds, thousands of evil skeletons have been found. Um, and that's the free model that I use for the reconstruction. So for the Gigantia temple, I was looking at solar alignments, and this is because, again, light was very important in Malta, and lots of temples seem to be aligned to various cosmological events. Um, what I did was I imported a 3D model into Unity 3D. I put a point at the end of the temple in this niche, and then I calculated the position of the sun throughout a year, every minute of the year. And from the position of the sun all the way you know, to the bottom, uh, I drew a line to the end, and if it didn't hit any surfaces, there was an alignment. If it hit the surface, then there wasn't an alignment. But the important thing with this is that it's generating new data. Um, so I'm not just checking if there is one alignment. What I'm actually doing is checking throughout the entire year to get a much wider picture. And this is, that is what uh, the results were. So you've got the two different temples. Um, but the first thing you can notice on the 21st of December, there seems to be uh, a peak alignment. 
that's when the most sound goes to the end for the most amount of time. Um, but one of the interesting things that I, I discovered while I'm doing this research was that it's not a single day. It's not the 21st of December, winter alignment, that's it. It's a whole month and a half before, a whole month and a half later. And even that peak alignment is for the entire week of the winter solstice. Um, so instead of having you know, a big one day celebration, this suggests that there may have been a longer event. If they made the doorways in a certain way to get this, this, this uh, longer stretch of time, then maybe this suggests longer periods of uh, celebration. Uh, and you get lots of other information as well, you know, a difference between the two temples. The second one seems to be rehabilitated to get even more light in, um, and, you know, different starts and ends and all kinds of interesting information. So again, this is showing that light was very important in the Maltese temples because you have this light going all the way towards the end of the temple for long stretches of time. Oh, no. <laughs> no, go back, go back. Um, so, yeah, so the other thing I was looking at is the property of circle. So, uh, as I said, it's an underground cave system and it's characterized by uh, lots of different compartments and areas. So, they develop some niches and blocks of blocks of area. So, there's, there's a con there's, um, they're, they're, they're trying to manipulate space in certain ways. And there's this idea in Malta that you uh, will build walls and screens to block out certain areas so that certain areas are visible, certain areas are not, creates a bit of a mystery uh, and it would have been used for things. Um, so one of the things I was interested in here was the visibility of the overall site. So I did this, this is the image you saw earlier. This is the overall visibility of the site, seen from human height looking downwards, so it's a bit of a 3D element as well. Um, and the two things which are very interesting of this is that in the literature, um, there's an area which is described as the display area. And this is an area where uh, a lot of skeletons were placed and it was very important. Yes. Um, and the display area is that one there. So there's a very high visibility in that area, which seems to demonstrate that this is a correct assumption. Um, the other thing which, I, which was very interesting is that um, there seems to be some kind of central corridor for visibility going down here. Um, and this is interesting because it parallels the temple. So you've got the central corridor, you've got an end niche, which is this one here, uh, you've got an entrance way, because there's a portal slab here, and you've got lots of axes either side. So it's showing again that although there's this binary between life and death, the two are still interconnected in the architecture. Something else it's showing as well, um, the good thing of simulations is that you can change very small variables to answer other questions. So um, I placed a screen here because there's a suggestion there's a movable screen in this area. There's a gully which seems to be progressively filled and empty and filled and empty, which suggests there was a stone screen that was placed and moved around. And by placing the screen there, this area becomes much less visible um, than it did with that screen in place. And this is again parallel to temples where they would use screens to block the view to different parts of the temples further on. It suggested there's, there's some kind of door system. Um, so it's interesting that they are controlling space and manipulating space um, to, to change what is visible and what is not for various effects. Um, so anyway, in conclusion, um, the reason I'm, I'm going for this is to, to show that 3D reconstruction is an ideal tool for simulation of environments um, and that custom scripts are very useful to answer very specific questions and produce new data um, which wouldn't be available otherwise. Uh, you can go to the site and, and test the visibility, but not to that extent. And you can monitor the sound position, but it's difficult to do it for every minute of the year. You'd have to set up a camera or something. Um, so it's, it's, it's much easier this way, and it gives a lot more interesting results. Um, these are all the different acknowledgements. I've got a blog that you can go and look at. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's pretty good.